sure. Morning, and people are coming in as we speak. So we'll give it a couple more minutes, let everybody get in, and then we'll get started. And I think we, I know we've got a full hour, so I want to make sure that we get started on time. So welcome everybody to the right of a boom blueprint. Um, we're here with our expert, um, Chris Garretts, and we'll, I'll introduce him in a minute because he's, he's really cool and I want to make sure I give his full bio. Um, but I am super excited for us to learn about the critical steps that you're going to need to take immediately after a cyber attack um, and the difference of what that means to either, you know, um, making a business ending event or a business survival. So I'm your moderator, Tanya Gentry. I'm the Chief Sales Officer of Big Red Media MSP Success. I know most people are used to seeing Jeff Johnson doing this, but he's taking a very long and needed uh, vacation. So when we get started here, um, a couple housekeeping items. So first, um, this will be recorded. So anyone that's on here right now, you will get the recording of this. Um, if you have to jump off for any reason, know that that's coming to you, you'll get it by tomorrow. Um, if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A. Uh, I'll make sure that Chris answers those at the end um, and we'll make sure that we, we answer everything that you guys have and get those out to you. Um, and then last but not least, at the very end of this webinar, I am gonna put a link in the chat um, for a very quick one answer survey. Um, and it's just so you can get one of these super cool um, Datto MSP success um, or like the super MSP logo on here for it's a Yeti. So if you'll fill out this, this quick survey for us at the end, we'll make sure that this gets sent out to you. So I am very excited to bring on our expert speaker. Um, he's a retired first lieutenant with the U.S. Air Force. And I'm going to read this because, again, I don't want to miss any of it. Uh, Chris joined Datto through uh, the 2022 acquisition of InfoSight a, detective, a detective, detection and response technology company. As the co-founder of InfoSight, he led the company from its inception as chief executive to, and head of product. Uh, for a decade or more, he was in the military service. Uh, he draws on both leadership and deep technical experience, serving as a cryptographic systems maintainer, a cyber warfare officer, and a pilot. Impressive. <laughs> Uh, in his first assignment, Chris was assigned to the U.S. Air Force Elite Defense Counter Cyber DCC practice. In his role, he led a team of 28 operators tasked with finding, tracking, and neutralizing state-sponsored threats on the U.S. Air Force's 2,800,000 node enterprise network. He also has his BS in electrical and computer engineering from Oregon State University. So welcome, Chris. Thank you for doing this. And, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Yeah, the bio is a mouthful, but uh, I tried to summarize it. Basically ran the incident response and threat hunting team for the Air Force for a while and then uh, started InfoSight. And we joined Datto. Datto joined Kaseya. Um, and we relaunched our product under the Datto EDR brand um here last year so uh we'll be going through uh a little bit we won't really talk too much product we're going to talk a lot about the incident response process what what to do after um that boom moment um and actually added some stuff in here about what what is right of boom there's a conference called right of boom we call the boom moment when you're attacked so we'll talk about the timeline we'll talk about uh the incident response process uh as well as follow along with the uh, uh the process set out by NIST um, on how to do that. So everything from what do we do before that boom moment, before we're attacked to identifying, you know, what just happened when someone attacks us, uh, containment, eradication, recovery, and what do we do after that? Uh, so that whole thing creates a loop. <clears throat> so what do we mean by boom? Um, whenever we talk about cyber attacks, a lot of folks kind of think in terms of a timeline that is, extremely fast seconds milliseconds something that's too fast for the uh for the human mind to even follow um this isn't actually true um there the boom moment kind of is if there's an exploit if there's some kind of vulnerability where we're being attacked um an attacker can just like 
execute that, throw a few packets our way and exploit that vulnerability to get uh, their malware to run on that system. Our prevention mechanisms, our firewalls, our controls that we put in place are the only things that can stop that moment from happening really. Um, so everything that we're doing to prevent people from getting in our networks uh, and preventing that boom moment where they actually get execution inside our network with whatever they're trying to run, um, we're trying to do that using our, our technology, using our um, uh, the controls that we put in place. What happens after that boom moment is usually more human centric. It's more um, more in depth. What do we do when we have someone in our network with privileges that's running around looking for either data to steal or looking for the domain controller so they can push ransomware and lock everything up so that we have to pay them? Uh, that time frame, that post compromise, post boom uh, stuff, actually takes a little bit of time uh, to move around to even figure out what systems they have compromised if they're compromising lots of systems did they get a you know did they compromise a flower shop with one employee or did they compromise a you know a major auto dealer that can pay me hundreds of bitcoins um, they don't know that when they first compromise the system generally unless they're highly targeted uh, and so there's a lot of things that happen the, to the right of that boom moment uh, and those provide opportunities for us to either detect them and stop them and respond to them uh, and discover that incident so that we can actually recover. Um, and so the hope is that we can discover those incidents um, in enough time to stop them from reaching their objectives. And their objectives might be stealing the data that they want, or it could be ransoming our whole organization. We want to stop them before that. Um, but we'll go through that incident response process. Even if we can't stop them before that, what do we do when we are ransomed? What do we do when we have an intrusion, but they haven't done something as big as a ransom? Uh, so we'll go through all of that. Uh, so the two processes that you know, some of you might be familiar with the one on the left, the NIST IR process uh, is what is promoted by the U.S. government. Um, a lot of uh, other frameworks adopt the same process, um, and it's basically four steps of preparation, which is before the incident, detection and analysis to figure out do we have an incident, and then containment, eradication, recovery. They combine all that um, in like our product in a more tactical uh, process that we use uh, also is a sans pickerel process. Um, that one actually just breaks out that red box on the left to be multiple boxes because technically um, it is more, it's really important to do things like containment before you're trying to recover. Uh, and so this, this left in this process sometimes uh, obscures that. And I've seen it multiple times when people respond to, to threats they start recovering from a backup before they've even contained the threat. And they're recovering a backup to a server that's owned by the bad guy. Um, so I like the, the pickerel process personally as a tactical framework to say, I wanna contain before I recover, um, but you can use both. It just It's just a breakout. They're pretty much uh, the same process. So we'll go through the, the NIST process because it's the one that's most familiar. It's the one that most uh, organizations and regulatory environments actually adopt. Uh, so IR preparation, this is before the breach, before the boom. Um, I like to use the word boom because breach is like, it messes up um, you know, the, the actuaries and the, the lawyers when we say that word. Uh, so I, I often have been recently adopting the word boom because we just got breached. That doesn't mean they have our data. Um, that doesn't mean they've ransomed us yet. Um, so what are we doing before that? The, there's really two things. One is be informed uh, of what could possibly happen to you. So before we can respond to a threat, we have to know what types of things are possible against our network, what things are actually, what trend, uh, trends are happening. Um, and so if we look at data from, you know, recent intrusions, we see a lot of them, you know, a third of them are starting from some kind of exploit of vulnerable software. So keeping our software up to date is a preventative measure we can do to stop a third of these attacks. Um, the, the second one there, cloud exploitation. Even if we patch everything and we have workstations that are fully protected, we have to understand that most of our crown jewels are now hidden in the cloud. Uh, they're they're stored in Microsoft 365. They're in Google. Uh, so what are we doing to um, be able to respond to that? So if we do have to do an incident, uh, uh, respond to an incident, um, if we only know how to respond to the assets that we control, and we've got a cloud breach where Microsoft 365 keys have been stolen, uh, we're going to have to figure out how to respond to that. And knowing that it's growing, it's doubling every year. Um, cloud exploitation indicates that we need to plan for that. 
Um, and that our process for responding, that's going to be very different. So being informed of what's possible against your network uh, and what are the biggest uh, forms of breaches uh, is going to really help us when we actually have one or to prevent one. The uh, next set on, you know, prior to the breach is being prepared. Um, the incident response plan, almost every incident response plan I've seen is a little bit out of date. Um, sometimes it's got a lot of extra stuff and folks haven't really tested it, really haven't gone through it. And when they do have an incident, it's the first time they're dusting it off and trying to read it. And it, it, you're in this, um, this oh no moment that's very time sensitive. You don't have time to read it. So developing the incident response plan is extremely important. It's not always going to be up to date, but at least developing it is going to help you in that process. Um, I think the number one thing from an incident response plan that you should know and have a readily available is who is in charge, uh, who's in control. Because when you look at the roles and responsibilities that happen during an incident, you have decision makers like a CEO um, or a board. Uh, you have technical leaders that know what the data is saying, what the logs are saying. Uh, you have people that actually own the IT systems that got compromised if it's the web server admin. So you've got a lot of stakeholders and you may even have to bring in a lawyer and an insurance company, uh, maybe a regulator. Uh, and so knowing who is involved when an incident happens and who is in charge of making certain decisions is really important because we've seen, I've seen multiple times that an incident goes uh goes really badly because no one knows who's in charge or who can make the decision. If we have to cut the hard line, if we have to reboot a server that's critical, someone needs to be able to make that decision. And it can't just be, you know, we have to go brief the CEO and ask for him. So developing that roles and responsibilities and the delegated responsibilities for when an incident does happen is really the probably the number one thing out of an incident response plan that I've seen uh, that can go really wrong. Uh, the other thing is having the tools and resources available. If if you're testing an incident response plan, um, consider just kind of walking through because a lot of a lot of organizations don't have the the time or the resources to go do a real attack and bring in an attacker. So there's a, something called a tabletop exercise where you just think through, OK, I just got ransomed. Who do I call first? Who do I talk to? And what are my resources available to, uh, to go through that? Um, that thought experiment can help you in determining what things are important in that incident response plan. Just think that through that and do that once a year, a couple, you know, once a quarter. Uh, just think through what could possibly happen given various scenarios. And if we're informed of the threat, you know, things like a cloud uh, exploit against our, our Microsoft 365 environment, um, thinking through how that would go down uh, can help us determine if we're ready for something like that from happening. Um, the third part of this is training employees. This is a, you know, the, your your IT admins and uh, and the folks that are technical, they're gonna probably be a little bit leg up, but they still need to understand how to report these things if they see something weird. Um, your employees that are on the the ground, like your accountants and your salespeople and everybody else, um, those folks don't have the technical expertise, but they still need to be able to understand what type of uh, a threat could possibly be happening. Some a lot of threats are a lot of breaches are reported by a user complaining about something. Usually, it's like, "Hey, my think my system's slow or it crashed. An exploit could have been thrown against it." Um, so, just having a little bit of training on the on the uh, employee side can really help you, especially prevent the breaches if they're um, doing things right, or even if you have one, uh, being able to report it early so you can respond to it before they actually ransom the organization. And we'll, uh, I think for questions where if you guys can do some Q&A, answer those, I'll, I'll try to wrap those up in the, the end uh, portion of it. But feel free to load those up and I'll, we definitely have time at the end there. All right, so our boom moment happened. Uh, detection and analysis is the way that we try to identify if that did occur. Um, sometimes it's really obvious. You get a little pop-up that says you've been ransomed, pay us Bitcoin. That's like the obvious one where we don't have to do a whole lot of analysis. We know we're breached. But the earlier in the attack, the less likely something like that's going to occur because generally that happens at the blast stage. So early on, if they're able to get you know, some early remote access tool, we call them rats, 
um, or a Trojan to run on the on you know one of your accountant systems, it's unlikely that that's going to have a pop up because they want to identify who they've been in, uh, who they compromised, and then figure out how they can distribute their ransomware and take over, can full control of the network. So that early stage is hard. We need to have the ability to identify those threats when they do occur. We have to confirm it's a real threat. Confirmation is probably the thing that the the technicians um, live the most, and that's. I have an alert from one of my tools or I have an antivirus alert that says I downloaded a virus. Is this really a virus? Is this really a threat? What do I do about it? And what's the severity? So this whole process of identifying that threat, confirming it, classifying it, and scoping it. Scoping is, is it on one endpoint or do they have the entire network already? Um, so trying to answer those questions are, are is going to be really important before we understand how to actually respond. Um, so let's just go through one of them. We're, we're going to use... Uh, you know, this is a screenshot from Data EDR, but you can think of this as um, any any type of EDR endpoint detection tool is going to be able to do something similar. Um, so in this case, we've got a behavior, and I want to. I've got an alert that says someone basically dumped uh, the memory of my security service, which holds my passwords. Uh, this is really common in all ransomware cases, almost all attacks that progress from that initial compromise, they want to steal an administrator's password because once they have an administrator's password, they can use that to go distribute ransomware everywhere, or they can use that to pivot to the rest of the network. Um, so this is a critical step that happens post-compromise, post-boom. And we've got various alerts and detections for the types of behaviors that do this. Um, ultimately, something like this uh, it's highly technical to say, hey, like they, they dumped um, LSAS memory. Is that good or bad? Uh, is this a is this a pull the cut the hard line type of incident, or you know what does this really mean? Um, in you know in the last five or five or six years or so, a framework called Miter Attack has gotten really uh, popular, and that catalogs all the things that bad guys do post compromise. Um, it actually is a compendium from pre to post. Um, but it does a really good job of cataloging all of the various techniques and common things that occur when an attacker is attacking a network. Um, so dumping the, the credentials out of memory of an operating system is a critical step in almost every attack. And having detections to be able to detect that technique from occurring is going to help us, even if they use a zero-day exploit that nobody can detect, there's still going to be a step where they want to dump passwords out of memory. And so a tool like an EDR is should be able to even if it's even if it, they bypass the initial execution and the initial uh, detection, we can try to catch them uh, in the middle of the, the phase where they're dumping credentials and trying to get passwords. Uh, so this case, we've got this alert and we've got to confirm what's happening. We know we don't want them to have our passwords. We know this is not common. Uh, so this is this is the detection that we that we found. Uh, whenever we're looking at an alert like that. Not all of them are going to be straightforward. Um, the tools that we use today to detect threats are getting more complex. EDR is much more complex than AV used to be. It used to be this file is good or bad. Now we have behaviors where it's saying, hey, this behavior occurred. Someone just dumped the memory out of our security service. Um, those are a little bit harder. So there's three things I would tell you whenever you're doing this process of identifying and confirming and scoping. Um, A, consider the source of where the, the alert came from. Sometimes we're told by you know, a third party that we have something going on. Sometimes it's our antivirus alert. Sometimes it's our uh, firewall. Uh, where did that alert come from? And what is the confidence of that alert and the capabilities of that tool? If it's a high false positive tool, we're going to have to put more uh, analysis time on it. Um, there's two actions I, I always uh, do, and I teach our, our SOC analysts to do this as well. Um, one, if you get an alert that says, you know, memory, you know, the memory was accessed where passwords are stored. Uh, someone tried to, to copy that over. I'm going to first deconflict with the administrator of that system to say, is that a normal behavior? Are you doing this? That alert might not be one I would expect an admin to be doing, and I would question why they would do that. But there's several alerts that do occur and behavior alerts, um, even antivirus alerts, where they install a remote access tool that flags on antivirus as a remote access tool that bad guys use. Um those alerts do come up. We want to deconflict with the administrator of that system or the user of that system that they did not do that. If they said, I didn't do that, uh, then our deconfliction can progress to, okay, what, you know, what, uh, what did cause it if it wasn't the admin, it wasn't authorized. So deconfliction is the important first step. The second one is correlation, especially with behavioral alerts. Um, 
if we got that same alert, you know, our passwords were accessed in memory, uh, we have to correlate that with other things that are occurring because sometimes software just does stuff like that. Uh, they, some of these alerts can can be false positives with third party software, with custom software. We don't know why it does it. Um, when we first developed uh, our signatures for this type of, of activity, uh, we noticed programs like Google Chrome were accessing memory of of uh, where our passwords are stored too. I don't know why they stopped doing it because all of the security products complained. Um, but there are cases where software just does stuff like that. Um, and it's just dangerous. It's not actually a compromise. So the second step we do whenever we're, we get an alert is correlate um, or review the context of that alert. And what that means is we've progressed to the point where a real threat, a real attack is probably going to have multiple behaviors, multiple alerts, maybe on different endpoints. Uh, or it could be in succession on the same endpoint, especially with something like a, a behavioral tool like an EDR, where a real attack is going to have multiple steps and that attacker isn't just doing one thing. So what happened right before that alert? What happened right after it? Oftentimes there's a logs that we can look at that we wouldn't necessarily want to alert to independently, but uh, they would be very useful for us if, you know, for instance, if they dumped the passwords for the admins out of memory. And then the second thing we see is in the logs is they logged in with one of those passwords. That's a real good indication that it's not software doing it. It's really a bad guy. So correlation is important to figure out what happened right before, or right after it to confirm that we indeed have a bad event. So how does like correlation work? Um, so like in our product, we, we implemented a, a correlation feature um, that basically takes a lot of these low category, low severity actions that could occur. One of the, one thing that happens really early in an attack is the bad guys will go and question the system. What system did I compromise? What is the username? Uh, what antivirus are they running? Uh, you know, what's a unique identifier? And what are the names of all the admins on the entire network? Um, almost every attack will ask these questions because they are questions that need to be asked. Individually, I wouldn't pay any mind to it. If someone enumerates all the domain admins, that could have been just one of my admins that did that. If they're doing a bunch of these things all at once in a very, very short amount of time, it's unlikely to be my admin because they probably know the answers to some of these questions. They don't need to ask them all. Um, so when we see these scripts happening, we often, if we correlate them all together and say, hey, multiple of these discovery commands happened all at once, we can promote these low severity, low confidence, mostly ignorable alerts to be a high severity, high confidence alert that we should do something about before they they take over the system and realize the value that they have. So again, a lot, sometimes alerts, especially with behavioral and EDR and uh, user behavior analytics systems, the types of alerts that come off of them realize that there's a bunch of low confidence alerts that they can produce. They, they should be labeled low confidence. Individually, they're probably ignorable, but together they can really indicate you have something bad, which is why we want to show them. So, okay, so we've, we've progressed, we've got an incident, uh, we've confirmed it, we've scoped it. Uh, the reporting requirements are probably going to be detailed in your incident response plan. Every co um, company has to have uh, an idea of what the, who they have to tell when they have a breach. Um, sometimes you have an insurance policy, a lot of times they're going to help you out. When do you inform customers and when do you inform the regulators? Uh, so I only have one slide on this and I'm going to progress more into the uh, technical aspects. But if your insurance provider has, if you have a uh, cybersecurity insurance policy, the reason why you go to them first is because they'll often pay for the response and they actually have experts they can bring in. So if you've, if you've uh, confirmed or, or if you've become aware of an incident, uh, contacting your insurance provider, oftentimes they have on hand incident response retainers with incident response firms, and they can have someone on site or on a call that same day or the next day. Um, so that can be really helpful if you really don't know how to navigate the the, the steps that um, need to happen to save your network or figure out what to do. Uh, regulatory requirements. If you're a bank or something like that, you're going to have your own process. If you're in Europe, you're going to have GDPR. GDPR is going to require you to report in 72 hours. Otherwise, they'll find you out of business. Um, so depending on what re um, regulatory framework you're under, you're going to have a reporting requirement, what government bodies or entities that you have to talk to. Uh, customers, there's, you know, for Europe and GDPR, they define this outside that it's not always a defined thing, but 
uh, being open and frank with your customers and the people that are impacted is always going to be important for how you recover and how your image looks after that breach. So consider those things, put it in your plan, have an idea. Uh, don't just listen to the lawyers. Um, you know, you have to have a PR image well as well. Uh, as an idea, a GDPR is uh, probably a good framework just to review. You don't have to follow it if you don't, you know, have your data in Europe or you don't have European customers. Um, but they've got a, a really good framework. And some of these things are a little bit over uh, what you should do uh, in some cases. Like if you follow their process, you can identify what things you might want to do. Um, for instance, they, they define when to report as when you become aware that personal data has been accessed or put at risk. Um, sometimes like in the US, it's it's more important to say, I want to not just be aware that we might have an incident or a risk of lost data, but I've actually confirmed it because if I'm doing it too early, I'll do it too often. Um, and a lot of those end up not being real breaches. So sometimes uh, if you look at what your threshold is for reporting, um, if you're aware of the possibility of loss of data, is that your threshold? Or do you, do you wait for confirmation that yes, indeed, we have lost data? Uh, those are important questions to ask. If you're in Europe, you have to do it when you're aware of the risk. So how do we contain, eradicate, and recover? Um, we're going to go through this one at a time because I feel it's important. Uh, whenever you're in an incident, everything is time sensitive up until you contain the threat. So I often tell people, don't try to eradicate, don't remove the malware, don't recover, don't go for backups until you've scoped and contained the threat. If the threat, if the threat actor still has access to your network, all your eradication recovery is going to be for naught because they're just going to keep um, going through your network and, and reinfecting it. So when we contain it, uh, we basically are saying the bad guy no longer has access to our network and the malware has been stopped in its tracks. So uh, if it is encrypting right now, we need to stop it from encrypting our stuff. Uh, if they have access to our network and they're able to send commands down, um, then you know we need to block those IPs and remove those remote access tools. So the containment part is the most important. And a lot of times we can do this, if it's a single endpoint, uh, we can do that by just isolating the machine. Uh, so when our, this, this image on the left, if, when you scope the threat, scoping is important because oftentimes the breach is on one endpoint. Someone downloaded something bad and they have you know some kind of infection on that one endpoint. Um, Oftentimes, the bad guy calls this their beachhead. It's the first system they get access to inside the firewall, and they're going to use that to move around. They're going to steal an admin's credentials. They're going to move around. They want to get to the domain controller so they can push access and uh, their malware to every server and workstation in the network all at once. That's the easiest way for them to, to move around. So if you catch them early enough, they're on one endpoint on that beachhead, and the action you do to contain that is usually just isolate that system. Uh, if you've got a, a piece of malware running, killing that malware and quarantining it, um, usually your antivirus will try to do that. If it allows it, then we still have to do that. If they've stolen credentials, we have to not only isolate the machine, but we also have to disable the accounts they stole because they've got some passwords. Um, so but it's going to be much easier if we catch them on that one endpoint. If we've scoped this breach that it's moved around to different servers, it's on multiple workstations, it's on the domain controller, we have a much bigger problem. Um, Blocking IPs is still going to be important, but we need to be able to purge them through the entire network or at least cut off their access so they're not able to move around anymore or send any more commands down. Um, so that I, I draw a line in the sand. Responding and containing on one endpoint is a completely different process than I've lost my entire network and they've got a domain admin or they've got my domain controller. Um, that requires a, a really concerted effort. And I would almost always bring in a third party expert if you've got more than one system involved or a domain admin has been lost to this bad guy. If you've got a situation where your domain admin uh, was part of the compromise, the password's been compromised, or the domain controller's been compromised, bring in a serious expert that's done that a bunch of times, because they're going to know a lot better on how to actually do that. Um, do your best to isolate the machines, but you still have to have you know access to these networks and isolating the main controller might cut you off from that. So when that eradication comes up, you know you've if you've contained the threat where the bad guy doesn't have access anymore, um, and I, I talk a little bit about this, the scoping is the most important aspect of this. Removing the threat from the beachhead once you've contained the beachhead 
Um, easiest way to do that. You can remove any uh, any malware. You can just nuke that whole box, um, and they should be purged from that network. So that early limited lateral movement, maybe they only have one system. You just wipe as you go, reset any accounts that got compromised, um, and you should be fine. That total domain takeover, uh, anticipate every time I've done a, to a response for a total domain takeover, um, it's required a lot of coordination because there's a lot of server admins and there's domain controllers uh, that are uh, owned that that serve the entire network. Um, even the people we would be calling sometimes would be cut off because if I have to reset the voice over IP server, uh, all your customers might lose access to even call you when they can't access their computers anymore because we're trying to recover from an attack. They can't even call us because I provide phone service for them. Um, that especially comes up with MSPs is like if they're if you're running a VoIP server, um, understand that a total domain takeover is going to have systematically remove access to all of that, hopefully in a very short amount of time, and the downtime will be short, but it does have to be everything. So again, bring in an expert for that because it can be complex. Looking at recovery, um, so restoring from a remote backup, that's going to be your number one uh, is having remote backups. Uh, a lot of times I've seen uh, organizations that have local backups only. If your backup is local on the box that's compromised, you should assume that the backup is also compromised. Local backup is only good for maintenance problems. It's not good for a, a cybersecurity attack. Um, if you've got a backup server on your network that your workstations and servers back up to, like it's technically called the remote backup because it's going to a separate server. But if that server that's doing the backup is also on the same domain that gets compromised, you should consider that loss as well. Uh, a lot of times, the, even if it's not lost and encrypted, um, they can infect those backups so that when you restore the backup, they are the only backups available are ones that are compromised. So local backups are good for maintenance, not for cybersecurity attacks. Remote backups are really important for this. So if you have the ability to add that, get get a backup in the cloud, um, Datto has you know, often said that's the first dollar in security. That's one of the things they've they've said for years is because regardless of how you respond to these attacks or how you prevent them, being able to restore uh, is going to be essential because there's no 100% guarantee you can stop every attack. Uh, the second one, don't tamper with evidence. Um, this is going to be something that it's sometimes difficult to do is, is to not tamper with things. But if you've got to contain a system, you're going to make some changes to it. Um, what I would say here is if the attack, if you, if the insurance company is going to require an investigation to figure out what happened, or if you want to understand um, how this attack even occurred, if you want to understand how to prevent it in the future, you're going to need to recover all of the logs and the evidence of that attack from all the systems that were impacted. So if you just wipe and reload the system without gathering the evidence, like the logs, you're never going to be, be able to answer those questions. And you know, if your third party requires you to investigate, they're not going to be able to investigate either. If the attacker was local, like maybe an employee, an insider threat, or in the U.S. or in a, a, a you know a major country um, or Europe or something, a lot of times they can go and prosecute the attacker, and they can't do that if the evidence has been tampered with or it's been deleted or it's you know you don't know where it's been. So don't tamper with evidence is something that a forensics expert or an investigator might tell you uh, to do. Um, do your best to contain. Don't worry about that if you're trying to contain, but don't wipe and reload everything if you're wanting to answer those questions uh, because that evidence is essential to answer those. Continue to monitor. If you've contained and you're responding, uh, you've responded, um, understand that there's sometimes actors are very persistent and they can come back three months later. Oftentimes that's not because you didn't identify the entry vector. Sometimes it's because they attack the organization, they realize they were being removed and they put a little backup remote access tool that will beacon out. It's like a second one that beacons out you know, a month later just to give them access again. So continuing to monitor after you have a breach uh, is important to have a little more scrutiny on the network that was compromised because oftentimes they'll come back a few days later, they'll come back a week later. Um, if it's a nation state, they do longer, but generally the, the, the financial guys, they have a short time period. So just continue to monitor after you think you've contained the threat 
so that you can identify if there's ever any secondary access that they uh, they enable later. So the final step, we went through four steps. Um, let, the lessons learned is not going to be the technical portion. Um, it can be, but that first time constrained part of identifying, scoping the threat, and then containing it. Once we've contained it, the time sensitive component can kind of lessen. Uh, then we start eradicating, recovering, and getting back to business. Um, the last part where we talked about evidence if you want to answer questions like, how do I prevent this in the future? We're going to need this step. So one of the things that everyone, you know, not everyone goes through an incident um, all the time. They're not having one every year. Um, a lot of folks I've walked through an incident, it was like their first major one. And so there's a couple things that once you've had your, your first major incident that everyone always wishes they had. Um, one of the things is having the tools in place already. So the number of times we've had to deploy an EDR or deploy some kind of tool that enables incident response on a network that didn't have it, um, I think it's like a majority of cases for third-party incident responders. They have to go deploy new tools because the network doesn't have the tools to respond, doesn't have the tools to have the visibility of what the bad guy's doing. We don't have the tools to scope the threat. Are they on more than one endpoint? We don't know. Um, and so oftentimes these incidents require that third party to come in and deploy new software. Uh, this is probably, you know, it's a terrible way of responding because you're learning a new tool while you're using it and you're under time constraints to, to reestablish control of your network. So if you've been through one, you know the importance of having the tools ready and being able to know how to use them. Uh, establishing chain of command, we talked about that in the pre-stage uh, where we talked about the, in, the incident response plan, having a leader or a chain, a chain of command or an incident commander. Some people use that term. Um, it doesn't become quite as apparent until you're in it that having someone be the person that makes the decisions uh, or at least makes the technical decision or whatever, um, that's really important. And I'll give you a, a small story. Um, I was responding to an incident with an MSP, fairly large MSP that had a lot of customers, and it was an actual breach on the MSP infrastructure, not the customers. And luckily, they were able to stop it from uh, propagating to any of their customers. They were able to stop the attack and kind of the first day that it occurred. Um, but it took a lot of effort and a lot more time than we we should have because there wasn't any chain command. Um, I was on this uh, I was on this uh, call with multiple parties. Everyone was on the call except for the CEO. And we discussed what needed to happen. It was a domain compromise. They took over multiple servers and we said, okay, we're going to reset the accounts and we're going to reboot those servers um, all at the same time. And it's the only way we're going to purge this guy. Uh, so everyone was on the board with that. And they, I said, okay, go and call me when you're done. An hour later, they called us and they said, okay, we did it. We had to, and I was like, What's, what, what was the delay? I said, well, we had to call the CEO and brief him on what we were going to do. And he said, "Don't take over the vo don't take down the voice over IP server. You can you can reset everything, but don't take the voice over IP server down because then our customers can't call us to tell us their email doesn't work." Um, and that made sense to him. But so they went ahead and did the purge, and they didn't purge the voice over IP server. The threat actor had a beachhead on the voice over IP server. So thirty minutes later, they repropagated all their malware to all the servers that had just been cleaned. Um, and so this is a problem with like who actually makes these decisions. This is, does, that, does that decision maker, have they been involved? Do they have the technical capability to make a decision like that? Um, so establishing a chain of command of who can make those decisions is really important uh, when you have those things because you don't want a, a situation where they just, you try to purge them and they repropagate re everywhere in your network. Third lesson is that speed is of the essence. Everything happens very quickly and people want answers to questions you do not have answers for very early. They want to know what's the scope of the threat? How bad is it? Is it confirmed? They want to know what does this mean? Who, what customers were impacted? What data was lost? And you're going to have none of those answers in the early portion of that uh, attack. And so the speed is important to, to be able to get that data, to be able to answer those questions, and to be able to actually properly respond. Because you can't respond properly if you haven't scoped how many systems are compromised. Um, so speed is the essence, and having the tools in place, having a chain of command, it's all going to help that. 
So that's the end of my presentation. I've got plenty of stories and I'll, I'll get to some questions as well. So uh, I really want to know what questions you have. Um, if you want to go through, you know, dig a little deeper into any of those portions, whether it's analysis or response or containment, I'm happy to answer those. Yes, we've got some questions on here. Um, Coleman Groves asks, do you consider BEC as a subset of phishing? Yeah, business email compromise. Um, so BEC, business email compromise, really big. Uh, it Phishing, that's a good question because a business email compromise is typically when um, like the CEO's email account is compromised. Like say they were able to log into the CEO's email in Microsoft 365. Uh, they're able to send an email to the accountant that says you need to send a hundred thousand dollar check to this Chinese bank, and you can't. You know, I'm phishing, so I'm not going to be able to take a phone call. Um, that's that's a form of business email compromise. Usually, it means that the email system itself is compromised, or they're spoofing someone. Um, phishing is generally when I'm trying to get a user to do something for me. Uh, generally it's, it's like I'm sending malware or I'm sending a link for that user to click so that I can gain access to that endpoint. Um, so in practice, I've used phishing to describe the act of compromising an endpoint. Um, whereas a business email compromise is spoofing of email, which can often not, doesn't have to include a, a, an endpoint compromise. Um, but I think they, they can be intertwined. They can probably, there's several attacks of business email compromise that included both or could be categorized as both. Um, so it's possible that I'd say, you know, business email compromise can be a subset of phishing in some cases. But often if it's just, the, you know, the, the, the CEO wrote down his password on his laptop um, and someone picked it up, logged into his email and sent an email, I, I don't think that would be categorized by, as phishing uh, by most organizations. Awesome. Uh, uh, are, go ahead. Go ahead. No, you want me to go? I'll do it. Um, are there any tools for tracking the decisions results of the tabletop exercise? Oh, you know, that's a good question. I don't actually know. I've never used a tool for a tabletop exercise. Um, a lot of times. So one thing, the, the, the thing, that the, the types of organizations that do these and conduct them are often incident response organizations that have been through a bunch of them. Um, and so especially larger businesses and uh, will have an IR retainer, like they'll pre-purchase 20 hours. So generally large organizations do this. Um, smaller organizations generally don't have an IR retainer expecting to have an incident. Uh, so what ends up happening is if you don't have an incident and you've bought 20 hours, um, the incident response firm will allow you to utilize those hours at the end of the year to do things like tabletop exercises. So most of them that I've been involved with have been the incident response company just coming in and doing a tabletop exercise and they've never used a tool. Um, that would be cool if there was one, but I've never seen it. Would you isolate by unplugging the internet? That's the cut the hard line question. So uh, most incident responders will tell you never to do this. Um, and honestly, I would probably say the same thing. Because oftentimes you're you're doing more damage to yourself than the attacker did. Uh, if you have zero visibility and you don't know what's going on and you have something really, really valuable, maybe that's the answer. But for one, most of our security tools and the tools I'm going to use to investigate the threat connect to the cloud. So for instance, our, our uh, isolation and EDR um, still allows us to access the endpoint with the EDR. So I can isolate the system so that the only thing that can communicate with it is the uh, the EDR. And then I log into that system or I continue to gather data from that system to try to understand it and try to contain that threat. Because I need to, if I isolate first, I still want to investigate to say, hey, did they move off? Did they get the admin token? Do they have a domain admin or do they have local admin? Those are questions I would generally ask after I've contained or I've isolated. So having internet connection to those systems is going to be important for me to, to access all those systems and ask those questions. So I generally would say no to cut the hard line, cut off the internet completely, uh, unless you just don't have the tools and you can't answer those questions anyway. Perfect. Okay, next quest 
question. Excellent coverage, well presented, thank you. So um, Ken mm -hmm. just wanted to tell you that. Um, let's see, what are the best tools to monitor a system for intrusion? Uh, so typically, like, you know, the old school antiviruses generally work on files. So from an endpoint standpoint, uh, old school antivirus and, and traditional EPP, uh, which is endpoint protection platform, they operate on preventing bad files from executing and preventing exploits from being thrown against a system. That is a preventative measure to stop the uh, system from being compromised in the first place. Uh, EDR is a feature of an EPP a lot of times that they've consolidated. It used to be separate product category. Um, EDR could be considered a monitoring tool that might have, that has response capabilities uh, and it does remote logging. So you get a lot more granularity on what's going on on that endpoint. Gives you a lot more visibility, helps incident response. <clears throat> a lot of people elect when they buy their endpoint platform, they don't elect for the EDR portion because they can't use the data. It's more too much data, more data than they could ever use. And they'll upgrade after the incident. Um, everyone always regrets that generally. Having that data and having the logging and having the behaviors that it's occurring uh, for context really actually reduces the amount of time it takes to analyze an incident and figure out what the scoping of it is. So I always recommend people actually elect to get the EDR. Um, and that's becoming more and more common. Insurance companies are starting to require it. And they're saying, hey, you need to be, have visibility of your network. And you're going to have to have the EDR functionality enabled in order to do that. Because um, those will those will give you more than just the system was you know, an attempt to uh, uh, isolate or an attempt to exploit the system was done or a bad file attempted to execute. The antivirus is going to take care of that. The preventative measure is going to take care of that. If we have a boom moment and they've taken over our system and they start stealing passwords and doing other commands, all of that's only going to be real, uh, visible if we've got something like an EDR. Cindy would like to know, isn't cutting, she quotes, the wire mm -hmm. from an obvious endpoint a good idea? Yeah, so isolation is the the typical response. So host isolation is the response uh, for any endpoint compromise because you generally want to respond with an action like that before you even have an idea of what the heck is going on. You don't have all the answers and you need to contain even if you have a risk of a, a threat. Um, and the best case scenario is you've got a tool that can isolate in a in a way like an EDR does, where it's like a partial isolation where I still have access to go and answer the other questions and to confirm the threat. Um, that way you can isolate as a more preventative measure. Um, because if I can't answer those questions because you just pulled the, the the line from the back and you don't have an internet connection anymore and you're relying on the user, um, oftentimes they're just going to lose their system and they're going to wipe and reload that system without answering the question. And then you'll, you'll, have, you'll be doing that all the time. Um, so I like a partial isolation where I still have access with my security tool rather than connect, disconnect it from the internet completely. It's like my, if my laptop is, is uh, potentially compromised, telling them just to like unplug it from the internet and store it in a closet, like it doesn't help me recover uh, very fast. And it doesn't help me answer the question, is this a false positive? And these days, because attackers are so good at blending in with the noise and making it harder to analyze, um, our, all of our security tools and you know, everyone who says like security tools suck and their vendor sucks or their antivirus sucks. The, the thing they don't realize is the, the threat actor is the one making that occur because they're constantly getting better and better at evading and making it seem like they're doing something that's not so bad. Mm -hmm. Great. So a next question we have is, what is the first simple protection or steps against cyber attacks? Yeah, I usually give three. Um, you know, for one, you know, like a Windows system, antivirus, a good protection, EPP a platform or whatever. I think antivirus, they started calling them EPP, endpoint protection platform, because it does a lot more than antivirus now. And EPP is an umbrella term that can include EDR. Uh, having a good one is really important. That's going to stop a lot of the ransomware attacks. Not going to stop them all. Um, uh, so having some protection software. Number two is account compromise is extremely common. So having two-factor authentication because password reuse is just, everybody does it. I'm really paranoid about security. And I sometimes reuse the same passwords over and over on different services. Um, so even the best of us do it. Um, so having two-factor authentication mitigates the risk from from a, a password compromise and account compromise. 
So those are probably the two best ones. Cindy would like to know what's all included in the data security solution. Uh, well, so Datto and Kaseya now have, I think, nine different products, maybe eight products that do security. So we've got, um, you know, Datto data EDR is my product that does um, endpoint behavioral monitoring uh, and response. Um, we've got a managed, you know, defender portion that does the preventative port, uh, part. And so it's a full scope EPP when you include our managed defender uh, capability. Um, and then We've got a SOC service called Rocket Cyber, where we can monitor the data off that and respond on your behalf. We've got email security solutions like Graphis, which do um, analysis of email. They can do like Microsoft 365 or Exchange monitoring. Um, ID Agent is a product we have that does uh, monitors the dark web to say, hey, your email or your password has been compromised in the um, in the dark web. Uh, so there's a lot of different things that that. Uh, that Kaseya and Datto have um, offered. It's not full scope, every security product in the world, um, but there's quite a few use cases for security that, that we offer. Yeah, EDR yeah. solution. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> does it attempt remediation? Um, not, not directly like automatically. There are certainly re response um, capabilities like isolate, killing a process, um, uh, deleting a, a file. The what we tell the vendor to do on the front end um, does quarantine and stuff like that. So it can automatically quarantine any threat that's really identified. If, if a threat gets past your prevention layer, generally you can only prevent what you have high confidence of and what you've seen before. Um, that's why antivirus, a lot of times people say like the signature approach of antivirus can't stop modern attacks because it requires us to have seen that attack beforehand. In order for us to auto remediate, we need to have seen the attack before and develop a remediation. Um, because oftentimes if they change a registry key or drop a file, we need to be able to say, yes, that is this thing. And we know how to respond to it. We know how to remediate. So a lot of that's baked into uh, the antivirus process. Um, when you see, uh, when you look at like data EDR and uh, some of the EDR and behavioral monitoring, um, we can't always define a full auto remediate, auto respond because those behaviors are not vulnerabilities. A vulnerability is something you never want exploited. A behavior is often just monitoring the use of a, of a tool and individually, let's take for instance, encryption. So we have an auto remediation, auto kill for our ransomware detection. And with ransomware, um, the action we are monitoring is the encrypting of files or the changing of files or the renaming of files. Uh, there's different ways ransomware works. They try to evade detection by using different ones. But ultimately, the action that is occurring is my file is being encrypted. I have to allow file encryption because you do this on your own. Users do this. Users will encrypt files. Um, you, your system will encrypt files when it's communicating with your bank. Um, and so the act of encryption is an authorized behavior. What I'm trying to detect is the misuse of that behavior. And generally, I have to wait for a few files to be encrypted. Um, and especially in the case of our stuff, um, our uh, auto respond to ransomware, um, you know, there's a couple hundred milliseconds where we're saying, hey, you're encrypting too much, too fast. And we have identified you as a ransomware. Um, you're encrypting user files in the user folders. So that file system monitoring is monitoring for the misuse of an authorized behavior. Um, and then we execute an auto respond, auto isolate. Um, and so a lot of cases, behavioral tools have that issue of how to respond to a behavior that's authorized. It's just being misused. And if it is being misused, we do have to go back and sometimes deconflict that the administrator is not the one doing it. So that'll that'll become more and more present um, as EDRs, like especially as they get more confident of the correlated behaviors, um, you're going to see more EDRs adopt more of those. Otherwise, most of the auto response stuff is going to be in the prevention module. Great. Any <laughs> any other questions that somebody wants to throw in the Q&A? And, and we've got some time. Oh, perfect. Um, is this a hardware and software solution? Uh, software. Almost everything we do is software. Um, like Datto Networking has these uh, network devices. Um, that are physical, but almost everything I deal with, especially software, all the security um, solutions are software-based. Uh, whenever you compare like a Datto EDR compared to others, 
Um, so my company Infosight was developed in 2014 when most of the EDRs were first getting adopted. So like CrowdStrike started in 2013, Sentinel One started around the same time. Uh, we all started at the same time. There are about 28 different companies. Um, not all of them made it. Um, we went down market. We were smaller, but we still had really good efficacy. Um, and so when we, or we, whenever I'm asked this question, like, are we as good as a Sophos XDR? Are we, are we as good as a Sentinel One? Um, my answer is usually we're very comparable. Uh, we all now follow, we're, we're now like nine years into the EDR market being around. We all follow the same framework, MITRE ATT&CK. We all try to get coverage of the important behaviors that MITRE ATT&CK um, defines. Um, the, the response options that most folks use are uh, isolation, quarantine of files, um, you know, killing processes, things like that. We have those features. So a lot of the core uh, functionality of all EDRs is going to be in ours. We have some really cool stuff that's beyond them. Our memory analysis is far, far and away ahead of CrowdStrike, Sentinel One, Sophos, all of those. Um, so we're a little bit better on in-memory fileless attacks or you know, maybe a little worse elsewhere, um, but I'd say it's very comparable. The thing that data EDR wins on is not necessarily being better than everybody. It's the fact that we, um, and that this is the reason Datto bought us and didn't just white label um, a top solution uh, that's like top market solution was because they wanted it to integrate with all their other stuff. So um, if you ask a Kaseya rep, like, how do you compare? They're going to tell you that if you are a Kaseya or Datto customer, our product's going to integrate with more of them. You know, we have a native integration with um, our rocket cyber monitoring team. We've got native integrations with our Autotask and BMS uh, system. So if you're users of those platforms, we have native integration because we own both sides of it. And we're going to be a little bit cheaper than Sentinel One. So, um, you know, I, I've got the, the large task of trying to maintain being better than them and being cheaper. Um, right now, I think we're okay, but, you know, uh, understand that, you know, there's other benefits to a, a Kaseya data platform than just having the best thing possible. Perfect. Well, I just sent um, in the chat, because we are coming up on the end here, the um, survey for, for mm -hmm. this. It wasn't a full uh, demo on your EDR, but we did put on there, if you want to know more information, um, you can you know say that, yes, I'm interested in wanting to find out more or you know not at this time. Um, and then just fill out your information. We'll make sure you get one of these really cool Yetis. So making sure that, that you get something, uh, again, it's the Datto um, Super MSP Yeti. So it's really cool. Um, I think well, that's it. I, I guess we've got yeah, one, one more, one more question, Cindy. Yeah, asked. I saw that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So isolating from a software perspective is pretty effective, but not perfect. Uh, uh, a really low level root kit can technically get around uh, some of those things because it's all software. So if you both have full kernel level access, you technically can like mess with each other. So um, in those cases, like a wipe reload of that system is going to be important or a firewall block outside the system that's infected is going to be your perfect method. Um, but especially in the early stages of an, uh, of an attack and most malware, I would say 99% of malware is still a user mode connection and the software isolation still works on it. And once they lose access to sending new commands down, it's really difficult for them to reestablish that connection. Uh, there are rootkits, especially nation state level stuff that tries to get lower level than that. But uh, the majority of malware, especially ransomware, doesn't get lower than that. Awesome. Anybody else? We've got a couple more minutes. I did, again, send that demo link in there, but we want to get any question that you guys have um, while we've got some time. We've got about 60 more seconds of Chris's time here. So, Yeah, I'd say, you know, for um, I didn't do a full demo here. A lot of my webinars, I like to keep a little bit higher level. Um, but if you want a demo of the actual product, our specialists um, are able to do that. And they're pretty quick. Our trials are really quick uh, to get to see the value and see the product. Um. You know, we do often sell EDR with a monitoring service. So MDR is managed detection and response. Basically, who's going to look at all this additional data that EDR is giving you? Rocket Cyber is our solution for that, but we also work with others as well. So consider looking at both, both of those. Great. 
So if, again, fill out the survey. If you are interested, we'll make sure you get there. Um, looks like Robert threw one more in here mm -hmm. about how do you see AI and chat GPT impacting security threats and your reaction to it? Yeah, I mean, because malware is already on. iterating very quickly. <laughs> this is just going to increase that, but it's also helping us. Like our analysts are using it to be like, hey, what, what do I do about this behavior? Um, and the internet already has those answers. So a lot of times like a chat GPT tool actually helps them too. <laughs> So it's helping both of us and it's constantly a cat and mouse game and that cat and mouse game just keeps getting faster. That's my answer for that. Very cool. Well, we are at the end of here. Thank you, Chris, so much. This was interesting and we um, appreciate you coming on and doing this. Again, that link is in there. If you guys can fill that out, we'll make sure that you get your, your uh, little gift for attending. Um, and if you have any other questions, uh, we will be sending this out um, tomorrow. To everybody that was registered, it will have a way for you to get in, in, in contact with Kaseya if that is something that you want to find out more information about, or you can let us know as well as at info at mspsuccessmagazine.com. So thank you, Chris. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.